names of groups. As I say, the richest elites belong to multiple planning bodies and steering committees, and do not even keep track of the names of all of them for themselves, as was revealed when Henry Kissinger denied knowing what the Bilderberg Group was, and when British Prime Minister Tony Blair admitted he perjured himself to the House of Commons when he had testified he had never attended the Bilderberg Group conferences. For this reason, it is expedient enough to list only a few of these planning bodies and steering committees, including both those publicly known as well as those attended privately and illegally in violation of the U.S. Logan Act against secret collusion between U.S. citizens and foreign diplomats, and then to study the past and present member lists of these few groups in order to find the big fish amongst the school of minnows like Kissinger and Blair. Suffice it to say about all these groups that the more senior the member, the longer-term plans they are allowed to present for the group to adopt. For example, if you are a little fish like Tony Blair, you are a yes-man in the war on terror and privy to little more intelligence on longer-term projects than daily briefings by your peers in the U.S. DOD and executive branch. If you are a little bit bigger fish like Henry Kissinger, you may propose projects that would extend into the future to take the same amount of time to complete as you have already been a member. As far as the example of Kissinger goes, he is a rather long-term planner, slightly senior even to Shbignu Brzezinski, author of The Grand Chessboard, a veritable New World Order geopolitical bible. Kissinger's plans for the gradual phasing out of Asian communism following Nixon's visit to Mao Zedong in China are considered epic in their scope by many in this class or field, but in truth Kissinger's authority in the current hierarchy extends little beyond the tip of his own nose. Kissinger, a long-term Soviet spy who gained so much access into U.S. policy making during the Cold War that it essentially dissolved the Iron Curtain between Washington, D.C. and Moscow decades before the Berlin Wall technically fell, must still bow and scrape before John David Rockefeller Jr. or Jacob Rothschild, let alone before King Fod or the Pope. However, as I have also said, these rich old men are all very psychologically sick. Most of them have developed peculiar antisocial predilections due to their genetic interbreeding and their social isolationism. It means nothing for someone of Kissinger's status in this field to order the napalm carpet bombing of Cambodia, or for someone such as George Herbert Walker Bush to order the economic sanctions on Iraq leading to the deaths of over 10,000 Iraqi children, paying, as former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright has put it, a price we were willing to pay. Thus, with that caveat, here is a short list of some of the most nefarious, well-known, and lesser-known groups comprising the rich elite's New World Order. The Trilateral Commission. The Council on Foreign Relations. The Federal Reserve. The Pentagon and DOD. The Intelligence Community Agencies. The Holy See and Vatican II Council. The UN the EU, NATO, the Bilderberg Group, the Bohemian Grove Camp, FEMA, NORAD, the IMF and World Bank, the Coalition of the Willing Member Nations, the DHS and TSA, the Communist Party of China, Skull and Bones, the Supreme Court and past presidents of the USA, the NYPD. As I have said also, everywhere you find anyone belonging to more than one of these groups, you will have found someone who has seniority to anyone belonging to only one within the hierarchy of elders, comprising the unofficial de facto New World Order. Names of Individuals One conspiracy researcher, Fritz Sprigmeier, whose work on mind control methods is second only to Joseph Mengele, inventor of the field, 
has proposed the theory that there are 13 families who own the world's wealth and control all the policy choices made by elected officials. This is a feasible theory, considering the concentration of wealth into the hands of a shrinking elite few. However, the concept of wealth being held by only a very few capitalist monarchs, so to speak, has been proliferated upon by subsequent researchers, such as David Icke and Jim Mars, to elaborate on inbreeding between these families over thousands of years to account for their rare genetic traits, such as the common blue blood ailment of thin bloodedness or anemia, or the once held distinct Habsburg nose, etc. The concept that a small number of families control the vast majority of the world's riches should not be mistaken in the circles of the New World Order for a system of hereditary titulary alike a national monarchy. One family can become rich in the same amount of time another can become poor, and only certain offices, such as the president, the pope, or CEO, persist. The people who hold these offices, the presidents, popes, and CEOs themselves, do not. I will not disavow Sprigmeyer's concept of 13 ruling families of the richest elite. Although I refuse to adopt the extension of this theory proposed by Ike and Mars and their ilk that the same 13 ruling families are the same bloodlines of the original ruling elite in Babylon. That seems, to me at least personally, making a mountain out of a molehill. On the one hand, we could easily disempower the rich elite by simply redefining the human concept of what constitutes wealth, as apart from their fiat corporate empires. On the other hand, it only empowers the already rich elite needlessly more so to imagine them being descended from the original Babylonian emperors. In short, even if it is true, it's irrelevant in formulating a strategy toward disenfranchising them. The method to destroy the New World Order is the same either way. Create a new form of economy that excludes them personally. For the purposes of excluding some of these people personally from the New Economic Order, I will give the names of only a few of the most notorious criminals alive right now who, nevertheless, have thus far avoided prosecution for their war crimes and war profiteering. And don't get me wrong here, either. Just because I might say George Bush Sr. and Jr., it doesn't necessarily mean Jr.'s daughters Jenna and Barbara, nor if I say Bill and Hillary Clinton, it should not be taken to extend to their daughter Chelsea, either. The sins of the fathers are only visited onto the heads of their sons if the offspring choose that course. At any time, any of these people may choose to repent of their corrupt ways, and change the whole world. But I digress. Here are some names. John David Rockefeller Jr. Jacob Rothschild Henry Kissinger Henry Kravis George Bush Sr. and Jr. Bill and Hillary Clinton Barack Hussein Obama Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, King Fod of the House of Saud, Dick Cheney, Joe Biden, Benjamin Netanyahu, Benjamin Bernanke, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, Ted Turner, Bill Gates, George Soros, James Baker, Christine Lagarde, Kofi Annan, Silvio Berlusconi, Vladimir Putin, Tony Blair, Tony Hayward, Michael Bloomberg, Rupert Murdoch, Joseph Lieberman, etc. The Agenda of the New World Order The agenda of the New World Order is simple, and, as I have said, reinforced by their psychotic insulation from reality. They want to protect their personal property, 
which in itself is noble and moral enough. Only they believe, wrongly, however reinforced by their psychosocial insulation from reality, that their personal property extends to include all the natural and labor resources of the entire planet Earth. That is insanity, to say, I own Earth, but if you asked any of the above shortlisted names I mentioned for their resume, that would be their chief qualification even if only for a job flipping burgers. These petty tyrant Napoleon complex type A personality tin pot chicken hawk armchair hypocrites are a dime a dozen among the upper middle class of the USA. However, what distinguishes a prestigious megalomaniac war criminal like George Bush or Henry Kissinger from the average upper middle class American citizen is about a $100 million bank account and a collection of at least 100,000 dead souls on their conscience that they were directly responsible for murdering. Yet even the names of the richest pigs in our present society will fade out drifting away on the winds of history like the lyrics of a popular song. Their contributions to the forwarding of the long-term agenda of the New World Order globalists will be recalled as irrelevant by a decade from now. Their personal property will be ours again. We will inherit their earth because they will die of old age. Micromanaging the global economy comes down to one man's job in this system. The chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank is largely responsible for setting the policies applied to the US economy in part due to U.S. policy choices, and in part in reaction to other global economic indicators. And it is, ultimately, the Fed's policies influencing the U.S. economy that determine the day-to-day -day fates of all other world currency markets, because they are all tied to the U.S. dollar, the so-called Federal Reserve note, as the world reserve currency. The former chairman of the Federal Reserve was Alan Greenspan, whose mentor was Ayn Rand, author of Atlas Shrugged, a book encouraging the so-called owners of the means of production, to go on a collective strike and self-destruct the system of industrialist capitalism from within. Greenspan, as Fed chairman, oversaw the collapse of the U.S. dollar's value during the Fed-induced mortgage bubble and consequent big bank bailout, endorsed pre-election in 2008 by both the Republican presidential candidate John McCain and the Democrat candidate Barack Obama. Ultimately, Greenspan blamed it on free market capitalism, claiming he was wrong in thinking that banking institutions would act in their own best interest to regulate themselves. The direct result of Greenspan's disastrous policies, continued by the present Fed Chair Ben Bernanke with quantitative easing, or QE, long held to be the first step of hyperinflation, is the Occupy Wall Street movement, comprised of literally millions of newly homeless U.S. citizens who have taken to mass demonstrations camping in tents in public parks in major cities across the U.S.A. The demands of the occupiers in this movement are few, but their placement of blame for their present situation squarely on the doorstep of the big Wall Street investment banking firms is obvious. Few solutions, such as the proposed Soros tax on the rich, seem capable of appeasing the insatiable appetite for justice of this brutally abused and ignored population statistic. Each occupier has their own beliefs, and, unlike the Tea Party movement, they collectively have absolutely no loyalty to any single ideology, even if it is against something, such as the radicals in the Tea Party opposing unconstitutional direct taxation without representation. There is no hope in blaming Wall Street for the present mess if you do not have any better method than them for cleaning up the mess they created.